<laughs> Come on in folks, we're here for a good time, not a long time. The <laughs> longer it takes for you to get in here, the more there's had to drink. <laughs> Full of gin. <laughs> 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 Delicious. Oh. Right, obviously, folks, okay, it'd be highly unprofessional of me to drink gin while taking you on a guided tour, okay? So before anybody goes onto the internet and starts to complain, <laughs> it's not full of gin, okay? It's not full of gin. It is full of water! It's full of water! Mixed with gin. <laughs> We're now standing in what is known as the outer ward of the Tower of London. That is to say, we're between the inner and the outer balliums or defensive walls. And the inner wall, it stands 50 feet high in certain parts. The outer wall behind you, 28 feet thick in certain parts. Down there is Mint Street, where all the coins of the realm were designed and produced until 1810. Now the buildings which house the mint are known as the casemates, or houses within the wall. And they not only serve as a museum, which you can go into over there, but they also serve as accommodation for myself, some of my yeoman warder colleagues and our families. Yes, as yeoman warders of the Tower of London, we do get the privilege of living here. And yes, you guessed it. And it's awesome! <laughs> <laughs> and over there is a tall, narrow archway. It's known as the Sally Port or the Royal Entrance. Beyond which, there was a small drawbridge leading out to the Queen's Stairs, directly accessing the River Thames. Now, rather than travel through the dark, dirty and dangerous streets of London, royalty and nobility would travel in their impressive barges along the river. They would tie up alongside those stairs, they would gain access through that archway, which is original and it dates back more than 700 years. It was at that very archway that King Henry VIII so lovingly greeted his second wife, Anne Boleyn, on the eve of her coronation in 1533. But poor Anne was fated to return to the tower just three years later, for a very different reason. <laughs> from a very different gate. And this uh, is the Bell Tower. Yeah? So who can tell me then? It's a really difficult one, this is. <laughs> Why it's called, are you ready for it? Yes. The Bell Tower. Because it's got a bell. It's got a bell in it! Yeah. Well done, well done, well done, well done. You're right, not too much, I gave the answer. <laughs> well done, it's well done, well done. Right, inside the white belfry on the top contains the oldest surviving curfew bell in the city of London. When it was sounded in alarm, that would have been the signal to close all the gates, lower the portcullis, man the battlements for defence. The bell tower is the strongest of the 13 on the inner ward. And due to its form of construction, it is obvious that prisoners were held within this tower. A man for all seasons, Sir Thomas More, Lord Chancellor of England, was held for 15 months in the lower chamber for refusing to accept King Henry VIII as supreme head of the Church of England. He was to say, I am the king's good servant, but God's first. At the same time, for the very same reason, his good friend John Fisher, Bishop of Rochester, was held in the upper chamber. And both men were to suffer terribly, but neither could be persuaded to abandon their Catholic beliefs. So they were finally led out through those gates and up onto Tower Hill, where they were both publicly beheaded as traitors in the summer of 1535. Now James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth, eldest of the 13 illegitimate children of King Charles II, the Happy King, yeah. <laughs> was also imprisoned in this tower. After the death of his father in 1685, this handsome and popular young man, very much like myself, <laughs> thank you, thank you. was persuaded to stake his claim to the throne by virtue of his uncle James II being a Roman Catholic. Now to press home his claim, 
He landed from exile in the west country of England and he marched inland, gathering popular Protestant support in what became known as the Pitchfork or the Monmouth Rebellion. And the revolt was crushed at the Battle of Sedgemoor on the 6th of July 1685. But James Scott escaped the battlefield. He evaded capture for a week until he was found hiding in a ditch near the town of Ringwood. Condemned to death in his absence, there was no need for a trial. And so three days later, he was led out and up onto Tower Hill. And that was to be one of the most botched and bloodiest executions ever to have taken place in English history. The executioner, Jack Ketch, used five strokes of his axe to dispatch his victim. And even then, the head remained stubbornly attached to the body. So Ketch pulls his butcher's knife from his belt and he proceeds to cut through the remaining skin tissue and sinew, blood spraying across his face and down his hand, making the knife slippery. He continues to slice through the flesh, slicing, slicing, slicing. Are we there yet? <laughs> slicing, finally, removed the head from the body. But strangely, both the body and the head were brought back inside the tower where they were sewn back together before burial in the chapel wall of St. Peter and Vincula. The reason for this, he was the eldest son of a king. They had forgotten to get a royal portrait of him. So, <laughs> so, they stitched his head back onto his body they dressed him in regalia and they propped him into a chair. And they commissioned an artist to paint his portrait, which still hangs in the National Portrait Gallery. It's also believed that the artist did say, this was the best sitting he'd ever taken. <laughs> Enough of this blood and gore! We must <clears throat> beheading! Right, around the corner of the traitor's gate in a bloody tower. Make a cut, use your elbows, because I will. <laughs> I won't use my elbows, folks. It'll be an elbow-free zone, OK? Elbow-free zone. <laughs>